ingredients used when compounding. The USP National Formulary includes over 5,000 quality standards for medicines. They have the active pharmaceutical ingredients and the, its excipients. It is the most comprehensive source for medicine quality standards in the world. There's also the Food Chemicals Codex, which is a substance list. If any substance comes from a non-FDA registered facility, you need to get it cer a certificate of analysis confirming that it has been examined and it does meet the specifications and quality with the FDA. If ingredients has no expiration date, then we can assign less than three years, uh, a date for less than three years as its expiration date. Surfactants are used to lower the surface tension between two ingredients in preparation to make them more miscible. Sus suspending agents are also called dispersants or dispersing agents. There is emulsifiers, also known as emulgents, which is a liquid dispersed in a different liquid. There are levigating agents, which is glycerin or mineral oil, commonly used for lipophilicity. These are also known as wetting agents. Glycosin gels are used as surfactants and delivery vehicles. Commonly used products are PEG and polyexamer, which are both delivery vehicles and surfactants. Both have hydrophilic and hydrophobic parts. Polyexamer is useful for topical drug delivery. Now these have hydrophilic lipophilic balance. It is a scale that ranges from 0 to 20. And emulsion is a liquid inside another liquid. So there needs to be a balance of both the hydrophilic to the lipophilic balance. Uh, that way you could see, you know, the two different liquids. So for surfactants with a low HLB number, which is less than 10, they are considered more lipid soluble and are used for water in oil emulsions. Surfactants with a high HLB number, which is greater than 10, are more water soluble and are used for oil in water emulsions. Now let's talk about degradation. So functional groups are su susceptible to this. So if they are affected, the functional groups surrounding the compound structure, then the structure can change and that could cause the product itself to change in its efficacy or what it does. Some of these are photolysis, which means they are sensitive to UV light exposure. So that could change, you know, the chemical structure of a drug, causing it not to work. There's hydrolysis, which is when water uh, can also affect the chemical structure, or in this case, the bond molecule, which could also ultimately also change how the medication works. There are also oxidation rea reduction reactions. So oxidation is when a compound loses an electron. Reduction is when a compound gains an electron. When one compound is oxidized, another must be reduced. And this is called a redox reaction. A real life example of this is when sugar is turned into caramel. Something needs to be oxidized and something needs to be reduced for this to happen, hence the redox reaction. So redox reactions could affect medication's efficacy. Therefore, we want to reduce any of these reactions when possible. We could reduce this by taking a couple precautions. These include in the pharmacy, having light protection. We could use amber containers to protect the medications. We need adequate storage. This means to make sure the storage temperatures, such as the refrigerator and freezer, meet the temperature regulations. There are chelating agents. These contain free radicals, which can catalyze oxidation reactions, 
causing the redox reaction to have no effect. And antioxidants are known as free radical scavengers. Examples of these are vitamin C, ascorbic acid, and vitamin E. And we could also control pH. And if we maintain adequate pH levels, then this could be used as a buffer for the product. Moving on to excipients. These are added to the active drug to help them stay form uh, and come in that tablet or capsule form that you usually see it in. These include binders, which are used to add cohesion to powder. Examples of these are sucrose syrup and acacia. Diluents and fillers, which are used to add size to very small dosages. Examples of these are mannitol and starches. Disintegrates, which are used to facilitate the breakup of a tablet after oral administration. Flavoring and color, we have a couple listed there. There are lubricants, preservatives, which prevent microorganisms from growing. There are buffers added which can narrow the pH range. And water is considered an excipient, but uh, it's usually used to wash equipment and your hands. Some hydrophobic solvents, uh, alcohols, are usually mixed in with water to break down insoluble objects. Insoluble meaning nothing that could very difficult to break down. We have alcohol USP, which is ethanol. We have methanol. We have ethylene cycolol. We have isopropyl alcohol, which is used for sterile compounding and products. It is a 70% is preferred. There are oils and fats, glycols such as polyethylene glycol, short for PEG, emollients and moisturizers. And for these, ointments are typically contain 0 to 20% water. Creams are greater than 20%, but up to 50% oil, while lotions have the most water and they are best for oily skin, while ointments are best for dry skin. Here are more excipients, so feel free to get familiar with them as well. Now here are a list of allergies for the excipients. Uh, the NAPLEX could ask you several questions saying this medication has an excipient that contains this um, and this patient has an allergy to this or this type of condition and it would be up to you to know that these excipients would be contraindicated in that patient so I would get familiar with these as well.